Now, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, the U.S. is a very large place, and there's a lot of states within it. You know, obviously, we have our 50, but each one is going to produce something different. You know, what is that percentage? At? What is? How do they produce that GDP? And that's why we talk so much about uh, the the Fed uh, regional Fed data because it's going to capture different pieces of it. Some of it's going to be more industrial, others is going to be a bit more residential. I, or I should say real estate generated. So I think this is an interesting one because you see just the five states account for, excuse me, forty one percent of U.S. GDP. So when you look at the areas that account for this you get an idea of just where that pressure can can come from. This is obviously in uh, Florida, New York, Illinois, and California, with then moving uh, further down to Washington, Ohio, New Jersey, Massachusetts, um, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, and Georgia. So it's a matter of, okay, well, where are these sitting right now? And then obviously you have the other ones in terms of, uh, you know, and a, a lot of this is going to be done by industrial financial services, and then farming. And so these different pieces, as we see the pressure coming down from the perspective of the financial and manufacturing side, that's when you look at the Northeast, that's where you get some of that bigger hit. Then you come further south, which has been a huge benefit of the migrating patterns from the south to uh, from the north to the south on the housing side from tech jobs from California and uh, Seattle coming back across. But what does that mean going forward? And that's where we see some of these slowdowns and why we talk so much about the migration of these, because if jobs are becoming less and less plentiful in some of these areas, which is causing, again, this bigger shift into the South, we saw that with home prices, but you're starting to see it slow because if you're selling a home in New York to buy in North Carolina, you need to sell your home in New York. And what we're seeing now is there's less and less people willing to buy that home. So again, that that pivot, that migration is really starting to slow to a trickle. But there's still people in transit. There's still some of that money that needs to be deployed, which is why you've had some of that holding up a bit better in the South. But as you get that, again, it, it starts higher and then moves down the supply chain, which is the pressure that we see. In 20 states, the real estate, rental, and leasing industry contribute the most to GDP. And when you look at where is that the most, it's the West Coast, it's the South. And then when you start looking at manufacturing, which is why we talk so much about Chicago and Philly when we're talking about the... Um, those regional feds, that's because it's picking, picking up a lot about our manufacturing. It's the real estate side. It's the re- rental and leasing side that we have the most concern on, especially when you look at the West Coast, where we see a lot of that migration moving out and a lot of that pressure continuing. And when you look at the what has happened in terms of that mig- migration into the South, again, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, uh, Tennessee has been a big one as well. That is when we see a bigger slowdown in some of the other GDP pieces, which was which is why real estate is so important when you're looking at when do we enter a, a recession, how low can GDP really go. This is these. The, I think this map does a good job of highlighting when and where and what to look for in some of these areas. While U.S. private construction spending has started to roll, but again it's starting to roll. Look at where it sits. So it's not like we're going to see this massive contraction in terms of, you know, happening overnight. Even if it went down at the rate of change, it went up. You're still looking at an elevated amount of spending over that period of time, which is why we do think it it happens a bit faster. It gets, (coughs) excuse me, it gets a bit, uh, uh, you know, the rate of change will come down faster, but also private residential construction, when you look at what is driving it, you know, when you look at the the uh, the new single family and home improvements, that is the biggest lion's share, but new single family is starting to slow. Home improvements, though, is is still staying fairly strong because people are deciding, okay, well, I was going to move to a bigger home. I've now been priced out of it. I would much rather stay here and do something else instead of it and and just and just expand whether that be second floor or or uh, or you know an addition on the back 
But there's, as supply chains catch up, if you will, as that catch up happens, that's when you should see those, some of those new single family homes qu- come to market much faster. And again, adjusting some of that, uh, that volume, which will also create a, pr- a problem because as you have more volume, as, just as you've already had a lot of people shift that migration, that again is going to push things a bit lower. So then when you look at ISM services, so that's what we looked on the real estate side, but on the service front, uh, services, uh, th- now th- th- we're going to look at two different pieces because remember one of them was showing contraction, which was S&P. Now July ISM services moved to 56.7 versus the estimate of 53.5. Uh, new orders bounced back as prices paid and supplier deliveries fell. Backlogs ticked lower. Inventory remains in contraction, though sentiment has expanded while employment is still contracting. So employment is still going down, but you're still getting some of that services that is that is supporting, but it's a matter of what is supporting it and why is there such a disconnect between these different pieces? It could be when was it taken, what factors are, are rolling in, which is why we look at so many different data sets because the trend is still moving down, but it doesn't have to move at the same pace and different areas and different things are going to move at that slower area as well, which is why there's such confusion of, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? Because there's some of those, uh, those positives out there, depending on what we're looking at, but employment is still contracting. And that's uh, that, that, that bigger problem that we talked about previously in terms of the availability of jobs and those job cuts becoming much broader. Then when you look at that, the uh, you know falling again within that bellwether, but ISM services PMI distance from 50 contribution, business activity better, new orders better, supplier deliveries is still providing some of that uplift. So again, when you pair that back, you have employment, which is detracting a bit. New orders is the one that is good to see in terms of how they're seeing that, but the business activity we know is moving in an opposite direction. So there's a certain amount of of things that we can discount based on what we've seen, but you're still in expansion. You know, even if we get really aggressive and say, "Well, this needs to be get discounted, this needs to be discounted," they're still showing some sort of expansion that that may be smaller, but still something more. Not what we're seeing here, but again nothing dies in a straight line. So you still are going to get that move down. It just is going to happen in a bit more of a measured way. Here, when you look at supplier delivery components for both ISM manufacturing and services are continuing to move down, which is going to bring some of that cost lower, but you're also going to have that shift of, well, now as manufacturing picks back up, do you, you fill those back orders, which have already been filled. Now you, this goes into inventory, inventories rise. Then you start to get that slowdown again. And we keep kind of seeing these back and forths, which some of it is good in terms of what goes into inventory because that's a net positive. But at the same time, where is it moving to? And we've seen a lot of those leading indicators that are showing that things aren't going to be all that great but it will go into inventory, which will be that nice offset to the Q2 number that we had where we had that decline after seeing some sizable inventory builds. So then when you look at new orders, here you are just kind of bouncing around right at, right at this, this level while employment continues to move down. But PMI new orders, this is a nice recovery. So this is um, now this is going to be a matter of is it going to continue this way? Is it is this something because okay, well, we're getting into into August. We have to get these orders in because we have to make sure they're ready for uh, for when school starts or for where Christmas is. So again, we really need to look at this. And is this a shifting trend, which is a positive, or a blip that's going to get reversed and move back down because employment is saying something a bit different in terms of you know what kind of activity is expected because there's no new hiring there's actually contraction on hiring or or like you know uh, um, uh, cuts and or um, or uh, jobs being phased out input prices again coming back down but as we were saying it's going to come down but we don't see it coming all the way back down but again staying at these levels even as supplier delivery times have come down because and we're going to show 
earnings uh, uh, wage cost continues to remain elevated, is continuing to be a driver of some of those input costs. So as you get supplier deliveries getting better or further or closer to normal, some of that is going to some of those input costs are just going to shift. So this is looking at S&P Global. So S&P Global U.S. Service Business Activity Index is in contraction. So you now have two very different views of the same thing, and that's where you have to discount both. You know, I, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. One is looking at different things, putting different weights on different things. And I just think it shows that the trend is is still under pressure. It's just, are we slightly growing, slightly declining? I think that right now you can say that, and, and I think Q2 numbers, is so at the as we closed out June, that we went a bit sideways. The, you know, we're going to use our judgment in terms of looking at the data and saying that, July is really where we pivoted down and the data start is going to show that as we go forward. Now, here's another one of those positives with the U.S. manufacturing new orders month over month. Expected was 1.2%. Actual was um, in June was 2%. Again, giving some of that credence to kind of where were we on that recession front in Q2. Our view that when you start looking abroad, again, looking at those leading indicators, South Korea, Taiwan, China, in terms of their their trade, that's where as that comes down, as those exports come under pressure, that's where we see this moving. Again, it's not going to go negative right away, but you're going to see that pressure to the downside. And again, this is the job openings. As you see that employment contracting, there's that definitive rollover in June jolts jobbing, uh, job openings at 10.698 million versus the estimate of 11, largest monthly drop since April of 2020. And we do see this accelerating in terms of job openings, which is going to change the paradigm of jobs fairly quickly. And I think, again, that's going to be another hindrance or a, another thing to watch as we're looking at economic health. And it's not, again, each place or each industry is going to get hit differently. So here you can see retail trade getting hit really hard, uh, construction starting to come down. And, and it, again, as that retail side construction comes down, that means that wages, can they really stay up there? So when you look at construction projects, which I, for anybody who has built a house or tried to get a house uh, repaired, those costs have been massive. And, and as you start to see a little bit more of that softening, you know, is that going to bring some of those costs down on the labor front, making it a bit more viable and protecting some of the costs on some of these uh, new builds? Now, job openings, non-durable goods, manufacturing, you know, coming down again. So even though you're getting some of those new orders fairly strong, non-durable goods, manufacturing, job openings is coming down. It's still elevated. And again, like that's the whole thing is it, you have to look at it, put it into perspective. It's like, yeah, it's down. It's still elevated versus historics. But where's the trend? Excuse me. When the trend to us continues to be lower, and as it continues to be lower, that's going to, again, put pressure in terms of where wages are going. Because it's still elevated, you still have wages that will go down. It's just there's enough in here at this kind of pivot point where you're still going to have those costs remaining elevated, which you're seeing here, where quit rates have kind of leveled off because obviously, you know, jobs aren't as plentiful. You're starting to see a little bit more stickiness in terms of the jobs uh, views. And that typically pulls down employment cost index. But look at where it is. You're, you're, the drop isn't going to be all that severe. So that's why when we look at those input prices, yes, the supply chain costs are coming down, but some of that is still going to stay. And you're not going to see that same type of drop in, the, uh, in private wages, which is going to keep things a bit pressure to the upside. So defl deflation risk uh, now in focus, uh, again, that's where we're starting to see the co consumer and income expectations moving down. We just think that is more of a 2023 event versus a 22. And the sources of the decline in labor force participation since the start of the pandemic. And I think this is really important because the labor, labor force participation is demographics are obviously there. You have people that are retiring. They, they were like, look, I was going to retire next year or in 2023. 2020 seems like a great time to do it in terms of where it is. And that, again, some of that demographic, early retirements, people saying, look, I was going to work another five, six years. 
you know, they may have accepted a, a package that was going to pay them for 18 months or do consulting for 18 months and walk away. That, But the exits for 16 to 54, that's where you that remains elevated. And that's the biggest problem in terms of why some of this cost remains elevated. But as you start to see some of these pivots and as, as living wages come down or income expectations, that's where you're going to see that that uh, that additional spouse that may have stayed home because of cost, where they're going to say, "I have no choice; I have to go back into the workforce," and 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 that's going to again weigh on some of uh, where uh, where some of this cost is going to be and what that participation rate. So we do see participant rate participation rate going back up, but that, as that happens, unemployment rate is going to go up, and that's going to make things look a, a, a bit worse, and I think true things up a bit. Now, when you look at manufacturing, uh, ISM manufacturing fell uh, to 52.8, pretty close in line to the estimate of 52. New orders fell to 48 and still contracting. Inventories rose to the highest since 1984. Production at its lowest since May 2020. And prices uh, paid fell to the lowest since uh, August 2020. Employment still contracting. So that's where you kind of get this disconnect. It's like, okay, so manufacturing new orders month on month is up. But then when you look at ISM manufacturing, things do not look good on a go forward basis. And that's where, again, this disconnect is there. And and this is one where there's enough in the terms of new orders fell, it's steeply into contraction, but inventories. Now we've seen inventories rising and we've talked about it last week, how there's a disconnect in terms of who has inventories. But this is the highest that they've been since 1984. This is a problem. And this is one that when you look at new orders, which is why we were saying going forward, yes, you may have had some some new orders come through in June, but July and be, and further is where we see those bigger problems. And again, that trend moving in the wrong direction. ISM manufacturing report on business supplier deliveries. This is just showing you kind of that round trip. And, and it's it's just some of that normalizing piece. And you saw that with the inventories catching up. But where are we going to go from here? And we don't see supplier deliveries shifting one way or the other, but staying fairly uh, cornered in this level being a better kind of setup uh, going on. But when you look at the, the distance from 50 and the contribution, inventories is that positive. And again, inventories is a short-term positive, longer-term negative when you look at, okay, well, is it, are the inventories building because I'm filling uh, my new orders, I'm filling backlog, or because nobody's buying them? And, and our view based on all of the data we look at is people are, aren't buying them the same way. So even though it's a positive contribution to the ISM metric, it's actually a negative from that, that viewpoint of where do we go from here with the same uh, new orders now contracting. And, and again, when we look at just where the, the production is, that's where we see some of that contraction as well. Now, when you look at uh, employment, uh, you know it bounced, still in contraction. That's something that we think trends in the wrong direction, with new orders expected at 49 coming in at 48, and again moving in the wrong direction in terms of where this is going to move. Manufacturing new orders year on year, uh, June factory orders at uh, at two percent versus that 1.2 percent, and again just reiterating and showing the disconnect, and that's where we think that the new orders again, is, is actually, you know, in terms of the different metrics, it's all about timing. And we do see this moving down. So now when you start looking at the purchasing manager index of the new order versus production, we see that movement in production coming down and the backlog of orders is also going in a straight line down, still expansionary. But again, so the backlog of orders is still expansionary, could, to, could describe why there's a little bit more left on that day, um, the other metric of manufacturing orders, but you're getting an idea that you're still moving in the wrong direction, even if you're getting some of this reprieve as we come into into July and August, which is why as we go back to school and move in, and further into Q3, we see things de- uh, degrading. And this just shows you uh, the ISM manufacturing inventories breaking out to those highs and customer inventories also seeing those increased levels, which is which is where we start talking about the problems we see on those new orders and the consumer buying. 
So ISM manufacturing prices paid coming, uh, coming much lower. But here's where we see a little bit of that support and we don't see this normalization back down because even though it's come down, it's still expanding. So it, it, you're still seeing prices going up. So you're not seeing deflation, you're just seeing prices going up at a slower pace, which is still the underlying problem. Uh, then ISM manufacturing PMI and ISM PMI orders minus inventories, again, showing that direction. Uh, Chicago uh, PMI coming from, uh, again, the Fed survey was 55, actual 52.1. Again, just kind of showing that direction, but still expanding, but again, moving in the wrong direction, coming to uh, what we discussed with Q3. Real personal consumption expenditures. This is what we were talking about with the spend up 1.1%, but only 0.1% in real terms. Disposable income up 0.7%. Inflation adjusted negative 3% savings lowest since uh, 09, which is why when we start looking at where things are going overall, you're starting to see that pivot. And that's what we see accelerating in July with consumer spending contribution to GDP growth still positive, but we believe in Q3 going negative. Employment cost up 1.3% quarter over uh, on quarter in Q2, wage and salaries up 1.4%, benefits up 1.2%. Private sector wages and salaries advanced the highest since 1982, which again is going to keep some of those underlying costs for the the for the company elevated and those issues that we've been talking about as the battle for talent continues. But it will slow. But again, it, it's it's slowing now, not rolling over completely. So this is where we see we still see some of those cost uh, in, implications. Uh, personal savings rate da back down to 5.1%. Uh, that's where you continue to see the pressure. And then as savings falls, debt is rising. And that's where we see some of these underlying pressure points that we've been discussing. And now when you look at employment costs, wages and salaries, private industry workers divided by consumer price index, you get an idea of how quickly and how uh, how fast these problems have, have really come to pass and why spending is going to remain that problem. All the, and, and again, as US GDP consensus 2023 uh, and then the other models, it's one of the reasons why we do agree with the GDP, Nordia GDP model. We will be in contraction and it will only get made worse by the uh, housing market with single family home prices versus mortgages. Again, showing you where that price is going on top of what we've already discussed. So then when you look at existing home sales, new home sales, uh, you know, and U.S. pending home sales, look at the trend. Again, it's all about the trend as to where is this going. So the housing market is losing that steam into a recession. And, and so, again, this is why we see it being deeper, harder, more painful than some of the others when we're talking about how this is going to end with median price of new U.S. single-family homes, two-month percent changed. Two-month uh, change in median price for new single-family homes has cratered 11.9%, worst in history and even beyond housing crash during the great financial crisis. So again, this is where some of the different things are becoming an underlying problem. Now, when we look at construction, June construction spending has rolled over. So here it's down 1.1%. Estimate was to be up 0.2. Largest monthly decline since April of 2020. Private residential down negative 1.6%. Public down 0.5%. Uh, Private home improvement down 0.3%. So again, starting to see that pivot. And that's where we see the more pressure coming in terms of where is this direction going. MBA mortgage uh, purchase index flatlining uh, again. We we didn't we we see it still coming under pressure, especially as net percent of domestic respondents reporting stronger demand for residential mortgage loans. Again, people are just not willing to lend the same way, and as that pressure mounts, MBA purchase index is also going to continue to move down. But it's also a seasonal thing, because if you look, typically we go sideways and then we start to fall just because things slow down, you're getting into year end, people don't like to buy homes during the school year, because then you're going to, you know, you could disrupt your kids. So this is where you see some of those, I, I think those important pivots, really. Then when you look at US bank lending standards and demand for mortgages, so tightening standards is going up, reporting stronger demand is going down. And, and that's where you know, we're getting more of that pressure when you're looking at how 
yes, like standards are, are starting to come up. They've, they've getting, they're getting worse and get, and going to continue to get worse, but there's also not a whole lot of demand for it, which is a bigger issue. Now it's important to look as, as people trade down. So the first thing you do is, okay, well, I can no longer afford the $500,000 home. Can I afford the $350,000 home and put a hundred grand into it to make it the same square footage? And that's where you're starting to see, you, you, we've already seen that. And that's what is going to, is, is providing a little bit of that bump, as you can see here in that below 200,000 and that below 350,000. But as a percentage of homes, that is still a very small number. So 16% of a small number is still a small number. So again, that's where the disconnect remains because it's, when you look at that five, that 550 to 800, that is where a lot of those homes are taking place. So for, that's 14% of a much bigger number, which is why we, we talk about this. But as you get some of that trading down, you'll get a little bit of that support for the 350, that two, you know, 200 and up. The problem is there's not a whole lot of them left because of inflation, because of additions, because of improvements. So that's why it's, it's, it's a bit misleading when you look at some of it over that time period, especially when you look at the trend for the below 200,000 level, there's just not a whole lot of them, which is why since, you know, 2013, it's been a, a straight line down. And uh, as they, as they, those get turned into $500,000 homes and beyond that red and yellow line. So uh, you have to be cognizant of some of that shift. Now, the percentage of fix and flip acquisitions feasible versus no longer feasible. Uh, and now over 50% are no longer feasible. And I think this is another key piece because there are some people that bought to uh, essentially fix and now can they fix it and make money? And that's where you start to see a lot of this slow down from an investment side as well and something to be cognizant of for people that, because some of these people were coming in with straight cash, that is going away now. And as that slows, that's again going to put more pressure to the downside, which is why when you look at construction rolling over, total construction spending, residential also rolling over, again, those are closely linked. So that's what we have for you on the rest of the U.S. Uh, going forward. Uh, you know, we're going to, in the next segment, we're going to talk more about Europe and where things are. Now, there was very little bounce. It, it, things have only gotten worse, and we want to provide a bit more of that backdrop.